Hi guys, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we'll be starting shortly. Thank you. All right, I think we should get started. Uh, my name is Alan. I'm a first year medical student. Um, I'm the president of the Bullet History of Medicine Club, um, the longest standing club in UNC School of Medicine. Um, today's lecture is titled Diabetes in the American Century, uh, presented by Dr. Richard McKinley Mizell. Um, he is a associate professor of history at the University of Houston. His research writing and lecturing uh, focuses on the history of race and healthcare politics, chronic disease, environmental health, and the historical connections between gender identity and ethnicity in medicine. Uh, just a little housekeeping. Um, we're gonna have a Q&A at the end. Um, so please submit your questions in the Q&A box. Um, this lecture will be recorded. However, please note that we're moving uh, recordings to a new server and past lectures are currently unavailable. Um, and without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Mizell. Thank you so much. I appreciate that introduction. Share my screen here. Sorry. There we are. Well, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, I also want to thank um, Raul and the UNC Bullet um, History of Medicine Club for, for this invitation. Um, as I've been talking about a little bit, I am originally from North Carolina, so this is a special treat. I've been born and raised in, in Raleigh, right down the road. So it's always nice to, uh, to, to, to have these conversations um, in the Research Triangle Park. So I am, um, again, a historian of medicine, race, environment, technology, focusing primarily on the history of, of chronic disease. And I am currently writing a history of, of race and diabetes in, in the 20th century. And um, part of my, my, overall, my overall argument um, is that um, diabetes narrates the history of the 20th century. That we can see um, the, the history of this particular chronic disease um, within the progressive era, uh, the great migration, um, depression era, um, New Deal, um, World War I and II, um, civil rights and black power movement, um, the post-civil rights era, and also um, the history of environmental disasters and, and other disasters. Um, so diabetes is in many ways um, a, a history of the 20th century is, is part of what I'm arguing. And um, what differentiates some of my work from, from other scholars writing in this field is that I'm, I am also very much interested in, in the complications of diabetes as part of this project, um, chronic kidney failure heart disease, amputations, blindness, physical disability, um, and diabetic headache as a window into chronic diabetes. And the complications of diabetes, I argue, um, tell us a lot about this long and tortured history of, of diabetes. So I, I want to do three things um, in, in relatively short order um, in this talk. Um, talk about a particular moment for us to think about diabetes during the long civil rights era. 
um, think about questions of inequality or, or how questions of inequality continue to frame diagnosis during the post-civil rights era. And finally, think about questions of diagnosis and our current COVID-19 pandemic. So I'll, I'll do those three things in this um, short talk. Um, but before I do that, I, I do wanna give a, a little bit of sort of overall um, context um, for how I'm thinking about this project and, and sort of some of the literatures that I'm sort of defining as part of this broad framework. Um, in 19, 1898, uh, a Johns Hopkins physician wrote that Diabetes is a rare disease in the colored race. Another physician writing in 1901 um, in the Journal of the American Medical Association wrote that about six years ago, a colored medical student asked me to see him for a cough and great weakness. The cough I found due to tuberculosis complicating diabetes. This, by the way, is the only case of diabetes in the colored I have seen. Uh, this comes from um, James Herrick, who was um, um, an influential figure within the world of sickle cell, emerging sickle cell disease at the time. And he was sort of making this comment um, at the turn of the 20th century about diabetes. So then how do we sort of think about this, this broad question? So my work, um, is situated within um, these sort of broader narratives or conversations around um, the transformation of, of disease identity and the ways in which um, disease sort of reified and, and in a sense helped, helped to create these ideas of difference and, and race. Um, so by the turn of the 20th century, um, as historian Arlene Tuckman and others have written, um, diabetes was considered to be a, a Juden Cronkite, a, a Juden, uh, Cronkite. Um, or a Jewish disease. Um, William Osler wrote that Hebrews seem especially prone to, to diabetes. Um, W.H. Thomas defined Jews as a race with a greater propensity for diabetes. The Hebrews, no doubt, are more commonly afflicted with chronic glycosuria than natives of the nations among whom they dwell. So the argument in part was that uh, this was a disease of civilization, that sort of the more civilized uh, an individual a group of people really were, the more vulnerable they were to, to diabetes. And the argument was that African-Americans and other non-white groups were not civilized enough to be afflicted by this civilized disease um, that results in sort of a nervousness. So it's a disease of of sort of creativity, of sort of nervousness, of, of, of sort of writing, of literature, of those individuals who are within the, the creative arts of, of business-minded people. And so in, in some ways, it sort of shows how this sort of narrative of, of, of who's superior was then um, reframed within this broader package of, of race and medicine. So some of the themes of, of this work um, include um, how diabetes crosses um, the color line and sort of thinking about um, the, the unmaking of, of knowledge. You know, my argument in this book is not that, that, that African-Americans were suffering from diabetes as well in the early 20th century. That much is obvious. I could spend two hours sort of detailing every aspect of, of how black people were suffering in the early 20th century. But I'm more interested in you know, why this knowledge was repressed and what was the race making project behind um, the silencing of this information. In other words, um, how, why is it that we don't know what we, we don't know and, and for what purpose? Right. So I'm also in particular leaning on STS theory, sort of thinking about questions of agnotology, um, the unmaking of knowledge, thinking about, for example, um, the lead industry, cigarette industry, and how information is repressed for a particular um, political purpose. Um, thinking about sort of the, the different meanings and ideas of diabetes, sometimes referred to as sugar diabetes, sometimes referred to simply as sugar. Um, how all of these sort of cultural uh, manifestations of this particular disease would take on many meanings. Um, the Great Migration um, is an important part of this project. I think the Great Migration has been woefully under theorized um, in terms of medicine and health. 
um, African Americans, Black people were moving um, to different parts of the of the country for a number of reasons to escape sharecropping, um, to escape violence for better opportunities, all of these things that historians have talked about for quite some time, but also for better health care, for better obstetric care, for, for better um, care of chronic um, and short term disease. Um, and also the medical um, civil rights movement, um, which I'll talk a little bit about in a moment, but um, this idea that you know, civil rights organizations in this era of the 1950s and 1960s um, really began to, to reshape attention um, to those diseases and illnesses that were um, disproportionately impacting African Americans. And um, thinking about um, the ideological archive, what we see and what we do not see um, within um, the archive. And here I sort of um, provide a lot of sort of theoretical intervention um, in terms of patient records, how we understand patient records and how we sort of see silences and omissions and, and read those silences and omissions within um, this broader, longer narrative of, of chronic disease and in particular diabetes. So um, quickly, this work spans the United States and Canada um, using historical archives from, from university, federal, state, and local archives, city records, census statistics, manuscript collections, interviews, oral history, physician patient records, and, and nursing records. I've, I've been at this project for quite some time. Um, like many of us, have been slowed down quite a bit by the, by, by the COVID pandemic, but you know, can't complain about any of this, we just have to do what we can do. Um, I actually have not been in an archive um, in, in two years now, um, but I'm hoping to do so um, again soon to, to round out what's, what's left for this project. Um, going back to my first project, which was a history of the 1927 flood, um, I sort of used protest fiction um, and blues, in this particular case, um, a novel and other novels um, um, that sort of highlight um, sort of chronic disease within the literature. Um, in this case, I've sort of become interested in this particular novel, The Lakestown Rebellion by Kristen Latini, who's a fairly unknown um, but influential for a moment um, novelist in the 1970s. And in this particular novel, the, the, the main protagonist, or one of the main protagonists is suffering from, from diabetes as she and others attempt to prevent a highway from being constructed um, through their neighborhood, traditionally black neighborhood in, in New Jersey. So the ways in which we think about the construction of knowledge um, and sort of various ways of, of, of knowing um, is, is very important for this project. Um, I'm a cultural historian, so I deal with novels, but I also deal with, with, with music and, and popular culture. First project dealing with the blues and, and jazz. This project also dealing with, with jazz and, and sort of um, hip hop and how we think about some of these questions. Well known to many of you is, um, are sort of the struggles of B.B. Of, of King, for example, um, who's suffering from diabetes. Um, the gentleman in the middle, um, Cannonball Adderley, um, was also suffering from, from diabetes in the early um, 1960s. And um, well known to people at the time, um, he would um, often have a, a manager who would, who would travel with him to make sure that he did not go um, into, a, an, into a diabetic shock um, when he was on the road. Um, on my sort of left screen um, is, is Malik Taylor, um, also known as, as, as Fife Dog from the popular hip hop group Tribe Called Quest who in 1993 in a song called um, Oh My God on um, the album uh, Midnight Marauders, um, uttered the, 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 the lyric, when was the last time you heard from a funky diabetic? And that was for many people, you know, probably myself included, the first time I had ever <laughs> really thought about or, or heard um, this idea of, of diabetes. So in many ways, he was sort of um, sort of reshaping um, this sort of long narrative for um, a, a, a new society and a new culture. Um, he was well known to have been suffering from type 1 diabetes at the time um, in the documentary Beats, Rhymes, and Life in 2011. He talked about that lyric, which he described as, as not necessarily political. It was uh, an accurate description of what was going on in, in his body, um, but it was also a lyric that just sounded um, right at the time. Um, and so, uh, so thinking about uh, Malik Taylor um, within this sort of broader sort of culture of how we think about diabetes, particularly type one diabetes um, in the late 20th and early 21st century um, is, is very important. 
So my research also um, situated within a growing body of scholarship on medicine and civil rights um, and civil rights movement. Um, most notably works by Keith Waylu, Dying in the City of, of the Blues, um, when he talks about um, a funding infrastructure um, that was sort of reshaped to think about the long suffering of people um, with sickle cell disease um, in, in the 20th century. Um, that had long been ignored, um, sort of cancer, um, sort of uh, sort of questions of um, um, how uh, sort of neglected um, certain neighborhoods or certain individuals or certain groups had been within the funding infrastructure and how that uh, some of those ideas um, and, and funding inequalities could be remedied. Um, John Dittmer's The Good Doctors, the Medical Committee for Human Rights and the Struggle for, for such Social Justice and Healthcare, um, defining the Medical um, Committee for Human Rights as a civil rights, interracial civil rights organization um, organized in the 1960s as a way of, of, of helping to desegregate some of the uh, medical societies in the American Medical Association, um, but also helping to, to desegregate um, other forms of, of medical equality within society. Um, Sam Roberts an influential book, Politics, Disease and the Health Effects of Segregation around um, how segregated neighborhoods and communities can systematically impact health and sort of influence um, epidemiological trends in places like Baltimore and other areas. Um, Jonathan Metzl's The Protest Psychosis, How Schizophrenia Became a Black Disease. Um, sort of uh, focusing on how schizophrenia was um, once considered to be a disease of whiteness, um, but by the civil rights era, um, considered to be a disease of, of blackness, um, arguing that um, those individuals against the civil rights movement argued that for those people, um, civil rights activists um, struggling for inequality, that they were essentially becoming sick because of their activism, that they were that they were suffering from schizophrenia because of their activism within the political um, arena. And that's an, an, an old argument, of course. And it's also an argument that um, Greg Mittman makes in, in Breathing Space that um, there were arguments that, uh, that this sort of recent uh, uh, sort of visualization of, of African-Americans or Black people suffering from asthma um, which they had long been suffering from asthma, but the fact that this was sort of suddenly visible to people, um, so segregationists um, during the 1960s argued that they were suffering from, from, from asthma due to their uh, participation in the civil rights movement. And, and finally, um, Alondra Nelson's um, Body and Soul, um, very influential for thinking about the important role of the Black Panther Party um as uh, as a vehicle for 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 broader questions and conceptualizations of medicine race and, and health care so you know this these are just a, a few of the books that uh, my work um, speaks to um, and situates um, or, or, or will be situated within um, and as part of sort of these broader conversations so i want to spend um a little bit of time um, on one particular case that I've, you know, really begun to think about um, seriously um, in terms of this project, and that is um, the life and, and, and death of, of Eric Dolphy. Um, Eric Dolphy was born in 1928 in, in Los Angeles, um, traveled to, to New York um, as a jazz musician, and um, not as well known as some of his contemporaries like John Coltrane or, or Charlie Parker or, or Miles Davis, um, but he played the saxophone, clarinet, flute. Um, critics argued that he was woefully underrecognized at the time. Um, one of his best albums, Out to Lunch, um, was, was a bestseller in the 1960s. And others said that his best work um, was in front of him. Um, he has, in, in many ways, in recent years, um, uh, benefited from a, a resurgence of, of popularity um, to his work, which was, um, admittedly, you know, even you know, more abstract than some of the, the bebop and, and jazz musicians of, of the era. But his death, in, in many ways, um, highlights um, an important moment for us to think about um, race and diabetes. Um, in 1964. Um, Eric Dolphy was in Berlin, Germany, playing a, a gig. Now, the circumstances of his death are, are not entirely clear in terms of whether um, 
uh, he, he collapsed behind stage or um, at his hotel. But he was preparing for a, uh, a set in Berlin when he slipped into a diabetic coma and through shock. And he was rushed to the hospital where he would later die. Now, in the days leading up to uh, his hospitalization, um, people around him, managers, um, friends, said that he was craving sugar, that he was craving um, sodas, craving all types of, of sweet foods. Um, Eric Dolphy was a, a fastidious man. He was um, not known to indulge. He didn't use drugs. Um, he didn't overeat. Um, many remembered him as a vegetarian. So it was very unusual to see him eating this way, um, craving these types of, of foods um, in the days before his, his death. Um, when he collapsed, um, suffering from diabetic shock, and was taken to a hospital. Um, from family and friends, the rumors, um, which continue to this very day, are that physicians assumed that he was Black from the United States and therefore was a drug addict, in particular, a, a heroin addict. And so they gave him um, anti-drug medication. The idea or thought that he might be suffering from diabetes um, apparently never enters into the, the equation from um, the testimony of, of, of sort of friends and those surrounding him. So, you know, what does this mean then? And, and so these are some of the, uh, the, the questions and the theories that, that I'm thinking about. Why, um, and, and we don't really know, you know, how much information um, was given to these physicians but um, what we do know is that there were a number of different avenues that physicians you know, might have taken um, that could have led them to this evaluation that he was suffering from, from diabetes. Um, as part of you know, this narrative of diabetes, there was still some ideal argument that African-Americans or Black people were, were less likely to, to suffer from diabetes, which had been debunked or was starting to be debunked, particularly by the civil rights era, but still held some um, resonance within certain um, medical communities. Perhaps not as much as the turn of the 20th century, but this was still um, a broad enough idea that it might make its way into um, you know, some of these conversations around medicine and science and would continue to make its way into sort of conversations of medicine and science to this very day. So in addition to, to sort of thinking about these questions of um, what a Chile and Bembe might sort of argue as biopower or necropolitics, um, there are also a number of ways of, sort of quote unquote seeing that, that we can, or, or unseeing that we can use to, to think about this particular moment, right? So the, the inability to, to quote, see Dolphy's pain was built on a systematic repression of what was medically known. The history of diabetes is haunted by imaginings of those repressed bodies in a way that sociologist Avery Gordon calls ghostly matters. She quotes the ghost, she says, quote, the ghost is not simply a dead or missing person, but a social figure, and investigating it can lead to that dense site where history and subjectivity make social life, end quote. The difference between what we, quote, see and what we know to be true is the place where history and subjectivity intersect. I argue that it would be illogical, for instance, to think of Black people as not suffering from diabetes. Yet the historical narrative renders this group ghostly or aberrant during certain parts of the 20th century and beyond. Dolphy and others presented themselves in the forms of, quote, intimations, hints, suggestions, and portents, end quote, that disturb the conventional narrative of science and technological evolution around diabetes, from LA to Berlin. Gordon is, Gordon is suggesting that attention be paid to, quote, the things behind the things of society to create a more imaginable past. Similarly, um, Alan Feldman and Didier Fassen and others describe this idea of cultural anesthesia, which in this particular moment, uh, perhaps numbed physicians towards Dolphy. 
to, quote, render the other's pain inadmissible to public discourse and culture, end quote. In his work on the denial of science and HIV AIDS in South Africa, Fasten defines the othering of certain bodies as unintelligible to those in power and therefore uninteresting. Like Gordon, Fasten also contests an official history that is irre irreconcilable with the silences and gestures of those ignored by science. Building on Fasten's work, denialism is at the heart of my project and this important conversation around Dolphy, particularly the ways in which denialism represents an ideological position where there exists a priori, uh, 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 pre-assumed justifications for framing who suffers and who does not and for what reason. Dolphy's suffering as an alleged black jazz drug user was visible. His suffering as someone enduring the complications of long undiagnosed diabetes were not. Diabe uh, denialism is underpinned by a systematic confusion in the real, where both knowing and not knowing becomes the reflexive response to information antithetical to a political ideology. And so Dolphy's death is, is interesting for, for two reasons as well, two other reasons. First, um, raises early questions of, of diagnosing diabetes in terms of what we now call types. Like the idea of thin and obese diabetes emerges in the 1950s with an evolving, uh, evolving understanding of autoimmune diseases. What was once referred to as more simply diabetes began to take on new meaning um, in terms of thin, overweight, and children, adults. Today, type one diabetes is considered a beta cell autoimmune disease that results in the failure of the body to produce the hormone insulin from pancreatic islet cells in sufficient amount to manage elevated blood glucose levels, resulting in the body becoming external um, insulin dependent. Known as juvenile diabetes because symptoms are often developed in childhood, prior to the discovery of insulin in 1921, um, premature death was common. Type 2 diabetes, referred to as adult onset because symptoms often develop later in life, is the result of a down regulation of insulin in targeted tissues of the body becoming insulin resistant. Beta cells might produce a normal amount of insulin, but will fail to activate receptors in the organs and tissues of the body. And over time, the body might also become insulin dependent. Um, as we know now, there are um, also sort of other conversations around um, what's, what's called latter or latent autoimmune diabetes of adults and, and MODI, uh, mature onset diabetes um, of the youth, um, which is um, in part that you know, people who we think of as type two suffering from type two diabetes can actually be suffering from type one. And, and people suffering from type one diabetes or, or as children can, can actually be diagnosed with, with what we consider to be type two diabetes. And so the assumption then was that um, Dolphy might be type two because of his age and he had not been known to, to need insulin, but his symptoms suggest that he could have been suffering from, from type one diabetes long undiagnosed. So these questions of, of, of types, and sort of misdiagnosis, I think, are reified um, um, by Dolphy's death um, and in ways that continue to, to hold um, important resonance um, today. Um, secondly, um, Dolphy's death highlights a need to rethink the medical archive and, and production of, of knowledge in, in the historical past. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, uh, I'm sort of still trying to sort of round out um, the research for this project. I've done quite a bit of, of research in, in Black insurance company records, um, Atlanta Mutual, um, United, um, Golden State Mutual um, Health Insurance Company records in Los Angeles. And one of the, the, the bodies of records um, I'm looking forward to the most uh, remaining is, is the North Carolina Mutual Life, um, which I think will hold um, important information not necessarily specifically around diabetes, but um, uh, in terms of how people were thinking about um, Black health um, in, in the turn of the 20th century and beyond. 
Um, and so historians continue to ignore um, various ways of knowing, including, for instance, Black insurance companies um, that emerged during the Great Migration period to address migrant experiences of medical neglect in the rural South, uh, where routine medical care was inaccessible. They also countered white insurance company claims that Blacks suffered primarily from contagious diseases like tuberculosis and syphilis, but not diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. In 1938, um, the United Mutual Benefit Company in New York published a five-year study of race mortality statistics in New York State. Examining the company's own internal files, hospital records, records of private physicians, and city health department records, the insurance company argued that deaths from communicable diseases were not nearly as prevalent as white insurance companies stated in their publications. The report made the case that, in quote, that quote, in New York State, during the five year period beginning in 1933, the leading causes of race deaths ranked in the following order, heart disease, pneumonia, cancer, disease of, disease of the kidneys, diseases of the circulatory system, tuberculosis, accidental deaths, uh, cerebral hemorrhage, diabetes, and social diseases. So as a historian, I'm sort of always pushing this envelope um, to think beyond um, sort of traditional um, narratives or, or archives that have become routine and common. Um, and, and I think that's an important part of sort of thinking about this long narrative or, or idea of sort of diabetes as a chronic disease, but also the transformation of diabetes and how diabetes crosses the color line. So, Dolphy's story also helps us um, to think about um, sort of more contemporary questions of, of sort of race and diabetes. And um, I'm, I'm so you know, very fortunate um, in many ways that I've sort of come across a few people who are um, you know, activists within the diabetes community. And they have really um, to sort of shaped how I um, sort of think about um, sort of type one and type two diabetes and sort of these questions of race um, within the last 15 to 20 years. Um, American Diabetes Association, which was founded in, in the 1940s and, and, and the Juvenile Diabetes Research um, Foundation um, uh, sometime later in the, in the 1970s, sort of highlight uh, in many ways um, these sort of questions of race and diabetes in, in the current moment. Um, if you look, you know, just do a simple Google search of, of Black people with type 1 diabetes, you'll see a, a fairly robust conversation um, occurring within various uh, online communities. And, and part of what these narratives tell us is that um, Black people with diabetes, uh, particularly type 1 diabetes, continue to have a difficult time being diagnosed with type one diabetes and receiving that diagnosis for, for their children. Now, going back to the 1950s, I, I didn't have time to, to really sort of shape that particular um, sort of narrative, but you know, as people, scientists began to think of sort of thin and, and obese diabetes, um, there was also a, a, a sort of a social and sort of cultural uh, manifestation that would occur as well as sort of thin diabetes began, you know, became, you know, more routinely attached with, with autoimmune diseases. Part of the argument was that autoimmune diseases were, were blameless and faultless and those people suffering from autoimmune diseases, thin diabetes were without fault. Um, at the same time, you start to see this, this, this parallel narrative that those individuals suffering from quote unquote obese diabetes or what we now consider to be type two diabetes were suffering because of, of bad eating habits of, um, of, of sort of failure to adhere to um, sort of medical protocols um, of, of various forms of indulgence. And so where type one, what we now think of as type one um, was considered to be a, considered to be a more blameless disease. Um, type two evolved um, within scientific and, and physician literature and, and conversation as um, a disease of, of fault of those individuals who were suffering from that particular kind of diabetes. And so that narrative um, continues to this very day, right? And so there's in many ways a, a separation 
in the minds of some people um, that type one diabetes is, is overwhelmingly um, a white disease. And that um, it, it's not that, that, that black people um, suffer less for some, you know, for some people sort of writing this narrative is that, you know, black people don't suffer at all from, from type one diabetes. And when you look at these online um, sort of venues, you clearly see that that's not the case. And so you see sort of moment after moment where or frustration where, where people go in and sort of interact with physicians and they, similar to Eric Dolphy um, in a different kind of context, refuse to see their suffering as that of type one diabetes. They just automatically, they assume that they're suffering from type two diabetes or from some other type of disease altogether. Um, more recently, um, sort of activists have pushed for the American Diabetes Association and the Juvenile Foundation to, to make statements around um, Black Lives Matter and, and sort of the George Floyd protest and both were, were reticent to, to do so. Um, when the juvenile organization put up um, an online flyer of, of, of Black people suffering from type 1 diabetes, there were sort of very nasty contentious comments on an online form um, that you know, the Juvenile Diabetes Association did not correct, did not take down or did not counter, which infuriated um, sort of many uh, Black people suffering from type 1 diabetes. Um, and so these narratives uh, continue to take shape and, and take hold um, in terms of um, these, this sort of broader question of, of diagnosis. So this question of, of diabetes, of diabetes and, and diagnosis um, also plays into our, our current moment as well. Um, as we continue to think about this, this, this moment of the SARS-CoV-2 you know, pandemic and, and diabetes. So in other writings and in other sort of conversations, I continue to think about um, this, this, this question of, of what happens when an ancient metabolic disorder and, and diabetes uh, meets uh, uh, a novel pandemic, or what happens when, when, when public health disasters collide, right? So by early April, um, experts on social disparities, um, early April, 2020, of course, um, experts on social disparities in public health in, in the United States were describing an epidemic of black suffering within the COVID-19 epidemic. The coming disaster was anticipated and feared by many who understood the historical vulnerability of Black people. Um, news coverage began to focus on the increased susceptibility of Latinos and, and African Americans who suffer comorbidities of heart disease, hypertension, and asthma. Um, COVID-19 attacks the immune system and mounting evidence it causes underlying autoimmune conditions to flare led to a sudden awareness of long ignored chronic conditions among African-Americans. Rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, type one, diabetes have all taken on new meaning. Diabetes is a dangerous COVID-19 comorbidity for social and biological reasons. Finding ways to exercise, eat healthy, manage stress and glucose levels, and make routine appointments with specialists to manage their disease is essential for every diabetic. This level of care is particularly crucial during the current pandemic. For some suffering from diabetes, the necessity of exercising inside or outside is laced with the fear of multi-generational family members who might become infected and the lack of usable green space in neglected neighborhoods. Fears of leaving the home for specialist appointments, cancellation, or the delaying appointments have led to a smoldering epidemic of diabetes and related complications nationwide. Um, in another piece, I, I make a similar argument around um, uh, individuals suffering from chronic kidney disease and the need to, to, to constantly, three times a week, um, venture out into, into the world to, to receive dialysis. In May of 2020, um, the WHO warned that numerous parts of the globe were suspending uh, diabetes-related services that would cause long-term harm. Amputations have increased across the world during the COVID-19 pandemic as foot care is delayed, wound care centers and clinics closed, and available beds for non-COVID-related illness reduced. The likelihood of gangrene and severe um, peripheral arterial disease leading to an emergency is higher in, in the United States and other countries. 
In some parts of the United States, the rates of major amputations during the pandemic has tripled. Delaying care is dangerous for diabetics or people suffering from diabetes under any circumstance, even a pandemic. Diabetes and COVID-19 coincide with yet another epidemic, that of poverty and inequality, housing insecurity, segregated neighborhoods, low wages, and being uninsured and underinsured add to the dangers. People with diabetes who live below the federal poverty line have long faced the repercussions of not being able to manage their disease and complications. Where people live, access to, physici to physicians, dentists, grocery stores, pharmacies and parks, and whether they can afford the high cost of insulin uh, makes the current collision with the COVID-19 pandemic dangerous. Access to insulin is part of the long arc of diabetes as well. The year 2021 marked 100 years since the insulin revolution that transformed the lives of millions of diabetics, people with diabetes, and transformed diabetes from a deadly disease into a chronic illness. Insulin was one of the world's first wonder drugs, and though affording the opportunity of a longer life, chronic complications now define the disease. Insulin remains far out of reach for many Americans due to high costs, as much as $450 per month for the uninsured. The unaffordability of insulin over the course of a century is a shameful disaster. The global advocacy for generic, biosimilar, and affordable brand name insulin is critical in moments of disaster as access to insulin has life and death consequences for so many. The lack of generic insulin has helped to fuel the global diabetes pandemic and makes visible the unique vulnerability of an ancient affliction to a new disease. The Centers for Disease Control um, highlighted that diabetes is, is an underlying factor in almost half of those who died from the COVID-19 pandemic. There's also um, worrisome data that COVID-19 might precipitate new onset metabolic diabetes. One route that SARS-CoV-2 spike proteins in our cells is binding the ACE2 receptors expressed in various organs and tissues in the body, among them the pancreas and kidneys. It has been suggested by um, scholars of uh, diabetologists that some people with diabetes produce more ACE2 receptors in tissues and blood vessels, providing more cellular access to the SARS-CoV-2 virus in ways that might damage B cells and cause hyperglycemia and impaired insulin functioning. In an editorial published in the New England Journal of Medicine, researchers su suggested that, quote, in the aggregate, these observations provide support for the hypothesis of a potential diabetogenic effect of COVID-19 beyond the well-recognized stress response associated with severe illness. Um, in June of 2020, uh, a group of 20 international scholars created a global registry and information database called COVID Diab. The organization's website suggests the aim of the database is to research diabetes, comorbidity risk factors, and potential connections with SARS COVID 2. So, these questions then, um, I think, is sort of a move to the last part of this, of this talk. Um, sort of highlight for us uh, a number of um, ways to, to think about this moment. Um, as you know, academics are, are well known for, for creating words or making up new words in, in some ways, but um, two of the, the terms that I've sort of begun to think about quite a bit lately, um, sort of this idea of epidemic chronicity or, or, or pandemicity. Um, or this idea that you know people have long been suffering from um, what we think of as this disaster, right? So for people with diabetes, um, they have been in, in an emergency mode for 10, 20 years. Um, this current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic um, is in many ways a continuation of the emergency that they have you know, been experiencing. And um, they will continue to experience this, this moment of emergency well beyond um, uh, this current moment, you know. So one of the questions, of course, Raul and I, and I sort of would know this as well. Um, historians are, are constantly thinking about this question of, of when does a, a pandemic end, or when does an epidemic end? Um, we can sort of talk a little bit more clearly about sort of when an epidemic might begin, but when it ends, and you know, and doesn't end for everyone at the same time, and 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 how so are, are sort of questionable. And so the beginning and end of pandemics. 
um, is part of how you know we, we continue to think about this moment. Um, so sort of very quickly, an example you know might be um, the polio epidemic, right? It, it's sort of a well-known story of uh, vaccines that were created in the 1950s um, by by Jonas Salk and and, and Albert Sabin. Um, and though the acute period of, of uh, polio um, subsided in the 1950s, um, this acute period was really replaced with the permanency of chronic disability. Um, iron lungs, as you see in this image, were not simply a symbol of the polio epidemic's acute phase, but would also become part of routine and chronic care um, for weeks, months, and, and years to come. Um, while the medical field and public consciousness um, would begin to, to bend towards other diseases, um, survivors of mid-century polio would continue to, to suffer the long-term consequences. Um, tuberculosis um, provides another very brief example of a disease that has been both epidemic and endemic in the 20th century, um, reflective of racist housing policies over crowded cities. Um, though no longer the feared uh, plague of the early 20th century, we have never gotten rid of tuberculosis. In 2018 alone, um, 1.5 million people throughout the world died from tuberculosis, and over 9,000 mostly poor and minority um, within this country were diagnosed, um, proving that it is still um, not a disease that we can place within the dustbin um, of history. Um, in poverty stricken countries, um, tuberculosis remains a clear and present danger. And um, HIV, very briefly, I'm running short on time here, um, is also a useful corollary as well. In some ways, the United States has declared victory over, over the HIV AIDS you know, you know, pandemic in recent years um, with, with heart therapy. Um, but in places like Kenya, um, the pandemic is in many ways still, still raging on. Um, you know, the HIV AIDS epidemic here in the United States um, uh, produced a groundswell of people suffering from tuberculosis and immunocompromised compromised bodies. Um, but also, um, more recently, scholars have talked about um, individuals um, with uh, in Kenya, for example, who um, sort of recall having to, to bury dead bodies in the early stages, early years of the, of the HIV AIDS pandemic in, in Kenya and how it um, sort of brought up memories of, of that moment with um, having to bury bodies um, in the early stages of, of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, so those two images in many ways shows a continuity of suffering or chronicity um, or pandemicity, so to speak, of, of how this emergency phase um, continues to, to be with us for, for some people. Um, there's been a lot of ink spilled on, on many of these questions. Um, one that, that I think is, is particularly useful for us to think are from a colleague, Jeremy Green and Dora Varga, who, who wrote uh, in, an, in an editorial um, a year or so ago of pandemics and the following action of, of an epidemic is perhaps best thought of as asymptotic, never disappearing, but rather fading to the point where signal is lost in the noise of the new normal and even allowed to be forgotten. So my concluding thoughts are that, um, you know, diabetes, again, is a window in so many, into so many aspects of, of American life and society, um, environmental disasters, um, Hurricane Katrina, which I um, sort of didn't have time to talk about, um, but also um, this idea of chronicity and, and disability. And one of the larger points that I make um, in my project is that diabetes is a window into um, you know, racism as a public health threat, um, that it's significantly racism, that it significantly impacts a large proportion of our society that demands um, systematic public health governmental intervention. And diabetes helps us to think about these sort of broader ideas within American society. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you about some of these ideas and uh, look forward to some of the conversation. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Mazel. Um, we have a few minutes about nine or so minutes to do uh some questions um i see there's a question in the chat uh from raul um 
So with regards to black owned insurance companies like NC Mutual, did these firms tend to take a less biased approach than others about the risk of diabetes faced by their black insurance holders? In other words, did these firms help the med establishment see the illness more fondly among black people? I did. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I, I do think that they, um, you know, they were in, in some ways um, convinced that um, black people were suffering from diabetes. And so they set out to, to, to show this as a way of sort of correcting um, the, the record, so to speak. Um, you know, I make the point that you have to look at all of these sources, you know, as in, in some ways biased, right? So, um, you know, some of the white insurance company records, you know, had, had an agenda. Um, black insurance company records um, also had an agenda. Um, but I think what's important about the black insurance company records um, is that they were um, in, in many ways um, reaching out to those individuals, um, you know, black people within uh, who were coming into their establishments, but also reaching out into the community to really try and, and sort of take hold of those diseases that were significantly impacting uh, people in their immediate community. And, and I do think that that's an important. And, you know, these records are often not, you know, there's very little, um, you, know, uh, you know, policy, you know, holdings in terms of people specifically suffering from diabetes or other diseases. But um, I think it provides a, a, a broader blueprint for how to think about Black health um, in the early 20th century in these moments in which conversations around diabetes were being reshaped. Thanks, Raul. Awesome. We have one more question right now. Um, how do you think people rationalize Black Americans having more issues with things like diabetes as a quote unquote them thing, not a long term ongoing social problem? Also, type it out. Um, well, I think that. Um, I think that there was this, um, there's, there's always a push to, to, to other um, certain individuals in, in with disease. And so by the 1940s and 1950s, it became very difficult for people to ignore the fact that um, there was an upsurge of, of Black people suffering from, from diabetes. And so this importantly goes against again, this long narrative of, of diabetes being a disease of, of whiteness. And so they have to explain, people have to explain to themselves and to others, you know, why this is significant, why these bodies continue to, uh, to, to be biologically different. And one of the ways that they would do this is by sort of essentially arguing that the disease that, that Black people were more susceptible to was different from the disease that white people were more susceptible to. Um, and sort of, therefore that takes on a, a political, social, um, cultural resonance um, within sort of biomedical science, within sort of science, um, but also within medicine as well. And so um, what that does then is sort of reshape uh, type one and type two into vastly different diseases with vastly different resources. And so the resources that are being, um, you know, uh, pushed or, or sort of pulled for, for one type of disease is separate from that which, um, which they argue um, would result of sort of poor choices of, of Black people and other groups. So it, it's partly about funding, uh, but it's also partly about sort of identity and sort of this sort of constant need to, to create and recreate difference within disease and within bodies. All right, very cool. Thank you for that. Um, seems like we don't have any other questions at this. Oh, we have one more question or two more questions. Um, just very quickly, because we do have to end that one. How do you feel about some people pushing to not teach about race-based medicine? 
Well, I'm, I'm very um, vocal about the need for medical humanities. Um, I've sort of written that in a piece in the Los Angeles uh, review of books. I think that, um, you know, this question of, of medical humanities um, being taught to, to on the graduate level, but also in college, I think makes for better practitioners, makes for better, better scientists. And it's important for people to, to understand the ways in which bias, um, sort of conscious or unconscious, can influence decision making, um, can influence policy, but can also you know, influence um, uh, medical care. So I think that there is a, a momentum um, for that um, in, in medical schools, and I, I could hope to continue to be on the front lines of that. All right, and then last question. Um, have you by any chance looked at any med military medical records, particularly for the World War II and Vietnam War draft physicals or for coverage of diabetes type two induced by exposure to Agent Orange? Um, not to exposure to, to Agent Orange. That's, that's an interesting question. I have heard that, um, but one of my chapters, actually the chapter that I'm writing first, um, is, is titled A Pampered Favorite Class. And with, within that chapter, I'm looking at um, World War II uh, medical records um, and sort of this, this idea that induction centers were seeing an upswing in diabetes among those individuals who were being drafted um, and who were trying to, to enter the war, which goes against um, again, their um, sort of belief system around sort of who suffers from diabetes. Um, but there was also this, this sort of very interesting sort of narrative about um, coming from the American Diabetes Association and, and, and sort of war officials about whether di people suffering from diabetes should be allowed to fight in the war, that they were a liability. Um, that's where this term of a pampered favorite class comes from, and that um, they were forced to wear essentially dog tags to announce that they were suffering from diabetes. They had different food rations. And so there were all of these conversations about whether someone would fall into a diabetic coma or shock on the battlefield and whether that would make um, fighting the war um, vulnerable for those particular units. So there's a, a large narrative, quite frankly, around sort of diabetes, um, war um, and this time period was also about the civil rights era, but increasingly um, um, in ways that Michael Udell has talked about, um, eugenics um, continues to rear its head um, during this moment as well. Um, whether diabetes should be removed from the gene pool and diabetes was considered to be a gene, a gene that could be passed down from generation to generation. So that along with the war, um, along with the war and along with sort of the emerging civil rights movement all began to emerge at the same time. So that's a, a great question. We do actually have one more question, if y'all don't mind. Um, where do you suspect the future biases are in a world whose data might be owned by a few large companies and corporations as well as representation in those places? Well, I think the, um, the future biases um, occur um, and things like uh, you know, what's called uh, cyborgs or sort of the artificial pancreas where um, you know, individuals have you know, more access to technological in innovations that will help them to manage um, various types of diabetes. Um, but you know, rates of uninsurance or, or underinsurance will significantly hamper those individuals who, um, um, who don't have access to those resources. So I, I really think technology, um, you know, you have sort of a miniature uh, dialysis that's sort of being produced now uh, for those suffering from chronic kidney disease that's being sort of shaped by fewer and fewer um, technologies. Um, and so I think as diagnosis and care changes and becomes more technical and specialized, um, I think that is going to leave people behind because we don't think about these questions of race and technology. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Mazel, again for talking with us and uh, it was super informative. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> and uh, very quickly, uh, thank you to the audience and uh, for attending. And our next lecture is going to be in April on the importance. It's it's titled on the importance of history to medicine of Chinese medicine as exemplary case. Uh, by Dr. Nicole Elizabeth Barnes. She's an assistant professor of history and gender, sexuality and feminist studies at Duke University. Um, 
she a little bit biased, but I was I, I was a student of hers uh, last year, so that was really cool. It's gonna be on uh, April fifth on Tuesday. Or, uh, that's a Tuesday at noon. So there's a link in the chat to register. But but otherwise, uh, thank you so much, um, and uh, hope you guys all have a great day. Thank you.